I'm so pleased that we got to share space together here and be on this hike together because one of the chapters in my book is really about being aware of, of the lands you're on, the history of those lands and who you share those with and how we're obviously visitors here. And I would love to talk more about why that's important for us to be aware when we are hiking or any kind of activity we're doing outdoors, why it's important to stop and take note. I'd love to hear a bit more about why that's important, I think, for people to be mindful and, and maybe how you bring that practice to when you run or when, when you're outside. Yeah, I think when we are experiencing the land, the landscape, everything that is part of it, we need to recognize that there is history here, there is roots here, and something that we see so common with indigenous peoples or first peoples of these lands is that we're constantly erased from every single narrative. And so that's something that I've seen as just a runner myself who loves running on trails, on pavement, wherever it is, that lack of awareness and being informed that indigenous peoples are still here. Mm -hmm. And just because that this is a city or a town or a trail or a national forest, that history has been completely erased. We're all guests on these lands. You know, this is, you know, Tongva Chumash territory that we're on. And I am a guest just because I am indigenous doesn't mean that these are my indigenous lands. Mm -hmm. My indigenous lands are back in the Dakotas over towards the Minnesota area and Wisconsin. But people need to recognize that there's history here and to put indigenous peoples into the present day. So being a trail runner, especially, I would love to see even just the running community start doing more land acknowledgements because these land acknowledgements are a sign of respect, they're a sign of honoring and remembering, but also showing up as how we can be better allies, better co-conspirators for into indigenous peoples. And so seeing that implemented at a race like the Boston Marathon or the LA Marathon, I think we'll start giving people new perspectives of indigenous peoples and that we exist after 1900, that we're not just belonging in the textbooks or in a Disney movie like Pocahontas or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so I think that also will help just build awareness and more support and kind of sending the, a very clear message of that we're still here. Mm -hmm. And not only just recognizing the indigenous lands that you're on, but also recognizing that there has been a long history of indigenous caretaking and stewardship of the land. Up to 85% of indigenous peoples take care of the world's biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we also need to recognize when we're outside is having that bigger and deeper connection to the lands, to the soils, to the water, to all of our resources and understanding that everything is interconnected, everything we have to treat with respect. And so I hope also that helps with that perspective of that reconnection with life outside of your house or your computer screen or anything like that and just building that deeper connection mm -hmm. that I think will go a long way for our society. Yeah, I agree. I think that in the language that I love that you use and that we should all use is the idea of, of being relatives to each other, to the land. I think you naturally are gonna have so much more compassion and care for something if you see it as you know, part of you, part of the same kind of system that's woven together, like you say, of the different elements of things. Could you just briefly explain what land acknowledgements are for people who don't know and kind of the importance of them too? Yeah, land acknowledgements are just a powerful, you know, solidarity, um, you know, movement that's been growing. Um, but it's, you know, acknowledging the indigenous lands that you're on and their territories and the indigenous peoples that have been the caretakers of those lands, um, because it is sending that message that they may not be here in this exact space because we've have reservations, we've had displacement and relocation. Um, but indigenous peoples of those lands still exist within our communities, within our states. Um, so it's giving that honor and appreciation and respect to those caretakers and to also show up as an ally of how can we also be caretaking these lands mm -hmm. as allies, as relatives, you know, for a much bigger and better, safer, thriving future for our next generations. And so I think when we can start doing it ourselves, whether that's at some event or a venue, we can also do it on social media. That's something that I really like doing is any running picture, or any kind of picture that I'm taking, I like giving the land acknowledgement of the lands that I'm visiting on or that I am currently residing on. Most of the time it's Tongva, Chumash lands, but um, just recently I was down on Kumie lands and then we were up 
you know, in the Ohlone territory up in Northern California. And so it's just something that helps build awareness, especially through social media, since that is a very powerful way for advocates and indigenous peoples to have a voice and to also show that we're here, we're doing all of this work, and this is how we can cultivate community in a really meaningful and beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And I do think that language around stewardship and being stewards is so important because it shows that there's like an active role we play. Like we, you know, obviously keystone species, we have a role here and like it wasn't just like our attitude shouldn't just be to like allow like nature to do its thing. Yeah. We actually have a role to participate yeah. in that care, that regenerating, that giving back. Whereas I, I think for so long it's been very much like we should just leave it alone and yeah. as humans we're not we're not good for this planet but I so disagree and I yeah. think that like narrative and language makes you kind of give up or, or yeah. sit back rather than really participating and kind perpetuate of the continuous cycle of, you know, these problems happening, like, you know, during this pandemic, it's given a lot of people opportunity mm -hmm. to go be outside. And I'm hoping that that's one step forward for people to recognize like how good it is to be outside you know to be in the sun to be in nature to be in all of the elements and to develop that relationship that i feel like so many people have lost mm -hmm. and i think another term you know with indigenous communities we like using is to like decolonize and people kind of get a little scared about like what that means and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff but we also can decolonize our like our own mind body and spirit in kind of disconnecting from mainstream you know media and platforms mm -hmm. and your job and when you can just do the steps to just disconnect from all of that and allow yourself to reconnect with nature and everything that's around you that is giving life to everything you feel that like love and compassion for it and so i'm hoping as more people are starting to come outside and enjoy trails and hiking and whatever forms of movement that they're doing i hope that starts building that relationship and seeing like this is absolutely beautiful and precious and we need to do whatever we can to protect it, to protect her. I really hope that people find their own kind of way to enjoy it that's right for them. I think for a lot of people it can be quite daunting or overwhelming when obviously there are so many different groups and or even stereotypes of yeah. the person who goes outside and outdoors yeah. and enjoys the trails and I feel and hope that that shifting to the kind of identities that we associate to these spaces. Yeah. Especially being a runner, an indigenous woman, a woman of color, the biggest thing that comes out for me is like safety and mm -hmm. what does safety look like and feel like, especially for people coming from communities and marginalized communities, communities of color, marginalized communities. And it's very different. And so like the outdoor spaces can be very daunting and intimidating and sometimes not welcoming, which mm -hmm. is really heartbreaking because I've had tons of conversations with other trail runners, um, you know, indigenous and black trail runners, Asian runners, you know, don't feel comfortable in, in that environment because because of other systems at play that kind of create that environment for them. And so I think we are starting to see that shift of these spaces being more accessible and feeling more safe because we're creating that community and addressing some of these issues that when we see it in racial or social or economic or climate issues, we're starting to address it now within the outdoor communities, having those conversations, really talking about what does diversity, equity, justice and inclusion look like and how can we make that safe for everyone? How can we make sure that everyone has a place in this world and has a place here on this trail or on the pavement or wherever it is that they can enjoy the outdoors? Um, because I think I think that's something that has been lacking a lot and that's why like in the running scene from like what I'm used to is you don't really see a whole lot of you know people of color sometimes especially within the trail running community um, but now we're starting to see like trail running clubs being led by communities of color and it's really growing and it's becoming really supported which is really great um, so I, I think that shift is happening, which is really beautiful to see. And I think too, you must have felt with your own organizing, um, with the organization
collection Rising Hearts, that's very much too a similar kind of theme of, of creating programming that, that feels reflective of those practitioners and people who are leading classes. You're looking at towards teachers that, that you see yourself in possibly, yeah. which I think is definitely creates some safety for people too. Yeah, I think that's been the biggest change for Rising Hearts in this last year during this pandemic is kind of saw a moment of opportunity to change Rising Hearts a little bit. We were founded out of the, the No Dapple Standing Rock movement and really trying to create a place to center indigenous voices and make sure that we are on those platforms and can speak about these issues of sovereignty of treaties um, and you know what was happening in Standing Rock and so we did a lot of grassroots organizing panels marches rallies um, but I saw in a moment this this past year of I really want to cultivate community in a, in a meaningful way and some of the things that I was taught growing up by my family and by my community, you know, Mataku Yayasin, we are all related. And I have always really connected to that. Seeing it as, as an indigenous person, we are all related. We are all connected. And I feel like that's kind of like the indigenous version of what intersectionality is. And when I started learning about what intersectional theory is from Kimberly Crenshaw and like, just really appreciating appreciating the foundation of that of like rising hearts is going to go in the direction that has an intersectional lens of bringing communities together while still holding space for indigenous voices to lead these conversations or at least participate in them for sure uh, but that's where i was like we're going to do some programming we're going to do wellness programming we're going to do a running club we're going to do a land acknowledgement initiative we're going to do all these things that you know are led by indigenous people but also hold space for other non-Indigenous folks to be part of it with us, to teach and share their medicine or knowledge with us, to help, like I keep going back to, cultivating community in a really meaningful and purposeful way, that people can have a chance at being part of this program or part of this movement, part of the growth, do unlearning and relearning together, and then hopefully that leads to that transformational change that I really want to see, that Rising Hearts really wants to see for our next generation so that we have a better, safer, thriving future, not only just for our next generations, but for Unji Maka, Grandmother Earth, everything. Creating community and, and giving space for that, I think it allows people to kind of pause and be in conversation. And I think the moment you start sharing stories and sharing kind of your experiences in history, the more like the similarities always start popping up, I think, as yeah. you connect with different groups of people, different sort of histories, different cultures, different kind of perspectives. Yeah. Those intersections, you're like, oh, this links and this links, and you start seeing all these kind of lights go off and realizing that everything is so yeah. kind of beautifully connected and, and that kind of liberation of a lot of those issues are like yeah. so intertwined exactly. you know, when you look at climate justice and, and, and all the, the things that just, yeah, web between. Yeah. We all, you kind of reminded that you're all sort of heading towards the same um, sort of goal and the same, yeah, liberation and, and joy to experience these things that people and peoples and everyone should, should kind of enjoy, whether that's a trail or kind of the city they live in or, um, or the kind of sport or career yeah. they're in as well. I think it's a powerful way to create space for us to be able to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, sometimes within movement spaces, we tend to be siloed within our own movement, which I totally understand. And that's how Rising Heart started was we're indigenous only, got to get our, our relatives like elevated, we got to be heard. But then I thought, we're never going to have that change if we don't start talking to each other. And a lot of our communities are being impacted by some of the very same things and we may be experiencing it in different ways, but we can all find, you know, like the breadcrumbs of to the root of the cause. And if we don't start talking to each other and hearing each other and then also allowing for allies, you know, who do carry, you know, maybe a certain privilege than others do, but allowing for them to sit in as well. I think that's when all of that growth and understanding starts happening. And I think that's when a lot of the narratives start changing and we gain new perspectives that support that community. And mm -hmm. so I think that's what I'm having a lot of fun doing with Rising Hearts. It's something very new. It's definitely a lot of work um, because I'm not just focusing on one community anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I really love seeing the support that we've been able to, to see like 
realistically of how many people are showing up from different backgrounds, different teachings, different voices, different perspectives, and just seeing like them sharing it within their networks and like our platform even or growing, you know, with our family that we're like growing together. So I think it's really beautiful. And I really hope to see more of that outside of Rising Hearts. And I think that is happening. I think there's often a hard transition and an exciting transition that like the learning, the unlearning, standing beside someone, whether that's physically in, in community or just kind of in solidarity and then taking action beyond that. I think yeah. it's always a really interesting, those stages of, of action and change kind of obviously at times you hit walls and, and you kind of feel like something's happening and then you kind of get set back by, yeah. by still there's these kind of attitudes or, or systems at play. But I think there is you know, a lot of energy needed, I'm sure, to, to push forward from both sides of, of yeah. everything. And yeah, I think it's always, I found in that journey of just noticing my own uh, unlearning to do and things that I didn't even know were kind of like societally put on to me through my education or yeah. through my own kind of privilege and unlearning those, but then then keeping the energy to, to learn something new and act off that too and, yeah. and keep going with that, I think is like a, is, is challenging and, and exciting too because you're shifting like chemistry I think in your mind because it's yeah. kind of like your neuro pathways are changing and you get to do different <laughs> things and like open up it's nice it's all part of community you know, yeah <laughs> thank you so much for this hike it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure to actually have real conversation I know it's and nice. I think that's when growth happens so what's your pup's name Billy Billy and then the cats are Frank and Hugo. Oh, I love it. <laughs>